chapter twenty five of my bondage and my freedom by frederick douglas this librivox recording is in the public domain various incidents newspaper enterprise unexpected opposition the objections to it their plausibility admitted motives for coming to rochester disciple of mr garrison change of opinion causes leading to it the consequences of the change prejudice against color amusing condescension jim crow cars collisions with conductors and brakemen trains ordered not to stop at lynn amusing domestic scene separate tables for master and man prejudice unnatural illustrations the author in high company elevation of the free people of color pledge for the future i have now given the reader an imperfect sketch of nine years experience in freedom three years as a common laborer on the wharves of new bedford four years as a lecturer in new england and two years of semi-exile in great britain and ireland a single ray of light remains to be flung upon my life during the last eight years and my story will be done a trial awaited me on my return from england to the united states for which i was but very imperfectly prepared my plans for my then future usefulness as an anti-slavery advocate were all settled my friends in england had resolved to raise a given sum to purchase for me a press and printing materials and i already saw myself wielding my pen as well as my voice in the great work of renovating the public mind and building up a public sentiment which should at least send slavery and depression to the grave and restore to liberty in the pursuit of happiness the people with whom i had suffered both as a slave and as a free man intimation had reached my friends in boston of what i intended to do before my arrival and i was prepared to find them favorably disposed toward my much cherished enterprise in this i was mistaken i found them very earnestly opposed to the idea of my starting a paper and for several reasons first the paper was not needed secondly it would interfere with my usefulness as a lecturer thirdly i was better fitted to speak than to write fourthly the paper could not succeed this opposition from a quarter so highly esteemed and to which i had been accustomed to look for advice and direction caused me not only to hesitate but inclined me to abandon the enterprise all previous attempts to establish such a journal having failed i felt that probably i should but add another to the list of failures and thus contribute another proof of the mental and moral deficiencies of my race very much that was said to me in respect to my imperfect literary acquirements i felt to be most painfully true the unsuccessful projectors of all the previous colored newspapers were my superiors in point of education and if they failed how could i hope for success yet i did hope for success and persisted in the undertaking some of my english friends greatly encouraged me to go forward and i shall never cease to be grateful for their words of cheer and generous deeds i can easily pardon those who have denounced me as ambitious and presumptuous in view of my persistence in this enterprise i was but nine years from slavery in point of mental experience i was but nine years old that one in such circumstances should aspire to establish a printing press among an educated people might well be considered if not ambitious quite silly my american friends looked at me with astonishment a wood sawyer offering himself to the public as an editor a slave brought up in the very depths of ignorance assuming to instruct the highly civilized people of the north in the principles of liberty justice and humanity the thing looked absurd nevertheless i persevered i felt that the want of education great as it was could be overcome by study 
and that knowledge would come by experience and further which was perhaps the most controlling consideration i thought that an intelligent public knowing my early history would easily pardon a large share of the deficiencies which i was sure that my paper would exhibit the most distressing thing however was the offence which i was about to give my boston friends by what seemed to them a reckless disregard of their sage advice i am not sure that i was not under the influence of something like a slavish adoration of my boston friends and i laboured hard to convince them of the wisdom of my undertaking but without success indeed i never expect to succeed although time has answered all their original objections the paper has been successful it is a large sheet costing eighty dollars per week has three thousand subscribers has been published regularly nearly eight years and bids fair to stand eight years longer at any rate the eight years to come are as full of promise as were the eight that are past it is not to be concealed however that the maintenance of such a journal under the circumstances has been a work of much difficulty and could all the perplexity anxiety and trouble attending it have been clearly foreseen i might have shrunk from the undertaking as it is i rejoice in having engaged in the enterprise and count it joy to have been able to suffer in many ways for its success and for the success of the cause to which it has been faithfully devoted i look upon the time money and labour bestowed upon it as being amply rewarded in the development of my own mental and moral energies and in the corresponding development of my deeply injured and oppressed people from motives of peace instead of issuing my paper in boston among my new england friends i came to rochester western new york among strangers where the circulation of my paper could not interfere with the local circulation of the liberator and the standard for at that time i was on the anti-slavery question a faithful disciple of william lloyd garrison and fully committed to his doctrine touching the pro-slavery character of the constitution of the united states and the non-voting principle of which he is a known and distinguished advocate with mr garrison i held it to be the first duty of the non-slaveholding states to dissolve the union with the slaveholding states and hence my cry like his was no union with slaveholders with these views i came into western new york and during the first four years of my labor here i advocated them with pen and tongue according to the best of my ability about four years ago upon a reconsideration of the whole subject i became convinced that there was no necessity for dissolving the union between the northern and southern states that to seek this dissolution was no part of my duty as an abolitionist that to abstain from voting was to refuse to exercise a legitimate and powerful means for abolishing slavery and that the constitution of the united states not only contained no guarantees in favor of slavery but on the contrary it is in its letter and spirit an anti-slavery instrument demanding the abolition of slavery as a condition of its own existence as the supreme law of the land here was a radical change in my opinions and in the action logically resulting from that change to those with whom i had been in agreement and in sympathy i was now in opposition what they held to be a great and important truth i now looked upon as a dangerous error a very painful and yet a very natural thing now happened those who could not see any honest reasons for changing their views as i had done could not easily see any such reasons for my change and the common punishment of apostates was mine the opinions first entertained were naturally derived and honestly entertained and i trust that my present opinions have the same claims to respect brought directly when i escaped from slavery into contact with a class of abolitionists regarding the constitution as a slaveholding instrument and finding their views supported by the united and entire history of every department of the government 
it is not strange that i assumed the constitution to be just what their interpretation made it i was bound not only by their superior knowledge to take their opinions as the true ones in respect to the subject but also because i had no means of showing their unsoundness but for the responsibility of conducting a public journal and the necessity imposed upon me of meeting opposite views from abolitionists in this state i should in all probability have remained as firm in my disunion views as any other disciple of william lloyd garrison my new circumstances compelled me to rethink the whole subject and to study with some care not only the just and proper rules of legal interpretation but the origin design nature rights powers and duties of civil government and also the relations which human beings sustain to it by such a course of thought and reading i was conducted to the conclusion that the constitution of the united states inaugurated to form a more perfect union establish justice ensure domestic tranquillity provide for the common defence promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty could not well have been designed at the same time to maintain and perpetuate a system of rapine and murder like slavery especially as not one word can be found in the constitution to authorize such a belief then again if the declared purposes of an instrument are to govern the meaning of all its parts and details as they clearly should the constitution of our country is our warrant for the abolition of slavery in every state in the american union i mean however not to argue but simply to state my views it would require very many pages of a volume like this to set forth the arguments demonstrating the unconstitutionality and the complete illegality of slavery in our land and as my experience and not my arguments is within the scope and contemplation of this volume i omit the latter and proceed with the former i will now ask the kind reader to go back a little in my story while i bring up a thread left behind for convenience sake but which small as it is cannot be properly omitted altogether and that thread is american prejudice against colour and its varied illustrations in my own experience when i first went among the abolitionists of new england and began to travel i found this prejudice very strong and very annoying the abolitionists themselves were not entirely free from it and i could see that they were nobly struggling against it in their eagerness sometimes to show their contempt for the feeling they proved that they had not entirely recovered from it often illustrating the saying in their conduct that a man may stand up so straight as to lean backward when it was said to me mr douglas i will walk to meeting with you i am not afraid of a black man i could not help thinking seeing nothing very frightful in my appearance and why should you be the children at the north had all been educated to believe that if they were bad the old black man not the old devil would get them and it was evidence of some courage for any so educated to get the better of their fears the custom of providing separate cars for the accommodation of colored travellers was established on nearly all the railroads of new england a dozen years ago regarding this custom as fostering the spirit of caste i made it a rule to seat myself in the cars for the accommodation of passengers generally thus seated i was sure to be called upon to betake myself to the jim crow car refusing to obey i was often dragged out of my seat beaten and severely bruised by conductors and brakemen attempting to start from lynn one day for newburyport on the eastern railroad i went as my custom was into one of the best railroad carriages on the road the seats were very luxuriant and beautiful i was soon waited upon by the conductor and ordered out whereupon i demanded the reason for my invidious removal after a good deal of parleying i was told that it was because i was black this i denied and appealed to the company to sustain my denial but they were evidently unwilling to commit themselves on a point so delicate and requiring such nice powers of discrimination 
for they remained as dumb as death i was soon waited on by half a dozen fellows of the baser sort just such as would volunteer to take a bulldog out of a meeting-house in time of public worship and told that i must move out of that seat and if i did not they would drag me out i refused to move and they clutched me head neck and shoulders but in anticipation of the stretching to which i was about to be subjected i had interwoven myself among the seats in dragging me out on this occasion it must have cost the company twenty-five or thirty dollars for i tore up seats and all so great was the excitement in lynn on the subject that the superintendent mr stephen a chase ordered the trains to run through lynn without stopping while i remained in that town and this ridiculous farce was enacted for several days the trains went dashing through lynn without stopping at the same time that they excluded a free colored man from their cars this same company allowed slaves in company with their masters and mistresses to ride unmolested after many battles with the railroad conductors and being roughly handled in not a few instances proscription was at last abandoned and the jim crow car set up for the degradation of colored people is nowhere found in new england this result was not brought about without the intervention of the people and the threatened enactment of a law compelling railroad companies to respect the rights of travellers hon charles francis adams performed signal service in the massachusetts legislature in bringing about this reformation and to him the colored citizens of that state are deeply indebted although often annoyed and sometimes outraged by this prejudice against color i am indebted to it for many passages of quiet amusement a half-cured subject of it is sometimes driven into awkward straits especially if he happens to get a genuine specimen of the race into his house in the summer of eighteen forty three i was travelling and lecturing in company with william a white esq through the state of indiana anti-slavery friends were not very abundant in indiana at that time and beds were not more plentiful than friends we often slept out in preference to sleeping in the houses at some points at the close of one of our meetings we were invited home with a kindly disposed old farmer who in the generous enthusiasm of the moment seemed to have forgotten that he had but one spare bed and that his guests were an ill-matched pair all went on pretty well till near bedtime when signs of uneasiness began to show themselves among the unsophisticated sons and daughters white is remarkably fine-looking and very evidently a born gentleman the idea of putting us in the same bed was hardly to be tolerated and yet there we were and but the one bed for us and that by the way was in the same room occupied by the other members of the family white as well as i perceived the difficulty for yonder slept the old folks there the sons and a little farther along slept the daughters and but one other bed remained who should have this bed was the puzzling question there was some whispering between the old folks some confused looks among the young as the time for going to bed approached after witnessing the confusion as long as i liked i relieved the kindly disposed family by playfully saying friend white having got entirely rid of my prejudice against colour i think as a proof of it i must allow you to sleep with me to-night white kept up the joke by seeming to esteem himself the favoured party and thus the difficulty was removed if we went to a hotel and called for dinner the landlord was sure to set one table for white and another for me always taking him to be master and me the servant large eyes were generally made when the order was given to remove the dishes from my table to that of white's in those days it was thought strange that a white man and a coloured man could dine peaceably at the same table and in some parts the strangeness of such a sight has not entirely subsided some people will have it that there is a natural and inherent and an invincible repugnance in the breast of the white race toward dark-coloured people and some very intelligent coloured men think that their proscription is owing solely to the colour which nature has given them 
they hold that they are rated according to their color and that it is impossible for white people ever to look upon dark races of men or men belonging to the african race with other than feelings of aversion my experience both serious and mirthful combats this conclusion leaving out of sight for a moment grave facts to this point i will state one or two which illustrate a very interesting feature of american character as well as american prejudice riding from boston to albany a few years ago i found myself in a large car well filled with passengers the seat next to me was about the only vacant one at every stopping place we took in new passengers all of whom on reaching the seat next to me cast a disdainful glance upon it and passed to another car leaving me in the full enjoyment of a whole form for a time i did not know but that my riding there was prejudicial to the interest of the railroad company a circumstance occurred however which gave me an elevated position at once among the passengers on this train was governor george n briggs i was not acquainted with him and had no idea that i was known to him known to him however i was for upon observing me the governor left his place and making his way toward me respectfully asked the privilege of a seat by my side and upon introducing himself we entered into a conversation very pleasant and instructive to me the despised seat now became honored his excellency had removed all the prejudice against sitting by the side of a negro and upon his leaving it as he did on reaching pittsfield there were at least one dozen applicants for the place the governor had without changing my skin a single shade made the place respectable which before was despicable a similar incident happened to me once on the boston and new bedford railroad and the leading party to it has since been governor of the state of massachusetts i allude to colonel john henry clifford lest the reader may fancy i am aiming to elevate myself by claiming too much intimacy with great men i must state that my only acquaintance with colonel clifford was formed while i was his hired servant during the first winter of my escape from slavery i owe it him to say that in that relation i found him always kind and gentlemanly but to the incident i entered a car at boston for new bedford which with the exception of a single seat was full and found i must occupy this or stand up during the journey having no mind to do this i stepped up to the man having the next seat and who had a few parcels on the seat and gently asked leave to take a seat by his side my fellow-passenger gave me a look made up of reproach and indignation and asked me why i should come to that particular seat i assured him in the gentlest manner that of all others this was the seat for me finding that i was actually about to sit down he sang out oh stop stop and let me get out suiting the action to the word up the agitated man got and sauntered to the other end of the car and was compelled to stand for most of the way thereafter half way to new bedford or more colonel clifford recognizing me left his seat and not having seen me before since i had ceased to wait on him in everything except hard arguments against his pro-slavery position apparently forgetful of his rank manifested in greeting me something of the feeling of an old friend this demonstration was not lost on the gentleman whose dignity i had an hour before most seriously offended colonel clifford was known to be about the most aristocratic gentleman in bristol county and it was evidently thought that i must be somebody else i should not have been thus noticed by a person so distinguished sure enough after colonel clifford left me i found myself surrounded with friends and among the number my offended friend stood nearest and with an apology for his rudeness which i could not resist although it was one of the lamest ever offered with such facts as these before me and i have many of them i am inclined to think that pride and fashion have much to do with the treatment commonly extended to colored people in the united states i once heard a very plain man say and he was cross-eyed and awkwardly flung together in other respects that he should be a handsome man when public opinion shall be changed 
since i have been editing and publishing a journal devoted to the cause of liberty and progress i have had my mind more directed to the condition and circumstances of the free coloured people than when i was the agent of an abolition society the result has been a corresponding change in the disposition of my time and labours i have felt it to be a part of my mission under a gracious providence to impress my sable brothers in this country with the conviction that notwithstanding the ten thousand discouragements and the powerful hindrances which beset their existence in this country notwithstanding the blood-written history of africa and her children from whom we have descended or the clouds and darkness whose stillness and gloom are made only more awful by wrathful thunder and lightning now overshadowing them progress is yet possible and bright skies shall yet shine upon their pathway and that ethiopia shall yet reach forth her hand unto god believing that one of the best means of emancipating the slaves of the south is to improve and elevate the character of the free coloured people of the north i shall labour in the future as i have laboured in the past to promote the moral social religious and intellectual elevation of the free coloured people never forgetting my own humble origin nor refusing while heaven lends me ability to use my voice my pen or my vote to advocate the great and primary work of the universal and unconditional emancipation of my entire race in a chapter twenty five end of my bondage and my freedom by frederick douglas